We are from Albuquerque, New Mexico, Central New Mexico Community College. It's a two-year school. My name is Quantina Martin. I am a student in the Survey and GIS program. I'm Anaisa Salgado. I'm a student in the Survey program. And I'm uh, Dan Chorb. I am in the Survey and GIS on, on my second semester. We were advised by Professor Ronald Horsbauer. The name of our project is a monitoring survey of the Albuquerque Metropolitan Arroyo Flood Control Authority, South Pino Arroyo Stormwater Channel. The purpose of our project was to monitor hydrological features and stormwater structures because they are an essential part of floodplain and stormwater management within the city of Albuquerque. The study shows that precise leveling is a key feature of a monitoring survey of an urban stormwater channel. Several survey methodologies are discussed along with their benefits, drawbacks, and integration into a precisely level monitoring survey. The site is on the Albuquerque Academy High School's uh, campus and managed by ANACA. <coughs> Features of the South Arro Pino Arroyo were tied to a city monument within the Ortomecta Pipe via a three wire level loop to site specific control points. The site was surveyed and tied to these control points using a Topcon GR3 GPS network rover, a Topcon total station, and a 3DR solo UAV. There were errors with each tool used when compared to the three-wire level elevation data, which will be discussed by Dan. Our team determined that no single tool or technique can stand alone in these monitoring of stormwater channels within Albuquerque. Um, Anissa will discuss our methodologies and Dan will discuss our results. And as you can see, this, oops, this here image is the location of the uh, soft channel arroyo. And then this is our site location within the Albuquerque Academy uh, School campus. The pink highlights the easement here in the uh, South Pena Arroyo and the blue is the flow of the hydro. Hello. To prepare for this study, we began by analyzing the project area, navigating through Albuquerque GIS along with several site visits. We located a nearby control monument with an orthometric height that we can use for our benchmark. Our applications initially began with a two-peg test to ensure the accuracy of the SOCIA level that we would use, that we would be using to conduct the three-wire level loop that tie, would tie into the City of Albuquerque Control Monument 15E20. Followed by GPS rover point collection to create a topographic map, total station point coverage collection, and lastly a drone flight. Here is the team conducting the two peg test, and as you can see the table here, the, the difference is among both readings are the same, which signifies that the level works perfectly fine without error. City of Albuquerque Control Monument 15E20 was the benchmark chosen to begin our three-wire level loop. From the project benchmark, we ran the level to all set control points. This is the control monument 15E20 and we run the level towards CP101 throughout all control points. I ran it back and closed within five thousandths. Here is Kelsey Chavez, student field assistant and I running the loop. It's a, it's a bit difficult to see in this photo, but as as it's a bit difficult to see, but I'm assisting the Philly rod with a handheld rod level in order to keep the rod plumb and steady so that my partner gets an accurate read. Moving on to the GPS rover point data collection. These photos illustrate us over a, con a, over a couple of our control points with the rover collecting not only another set of elevation data, but a horizontal positioning.
Hundreds of points were collected with the GPS rover along the top and toes of the slopes in order to create an attractive topographic map. Here, Dan is setting a control point in the middle of the arroyo to assist point data collection where the GPS could not affix to, beneath the trees and mesquite, for example. GPS could not receive signal, oh, sorry, receive signal along the lines over here because it was blocked off by the wall and the trees on the side. More data collection using the rover guided us more towards autonomous positions as we moved closer to towards trees or walls. Anything that weakened the signal between satellite and the receiver gave us more reason to pull out the total station. Here we're collecting points that the total station could not, I mean that the GPS could not collect. Trees and other components made it very difficult for the GPS receiver to pick up anything. Therefore, the team later filled in those missing points with a total station in order to produce a nice and presentable topographic map. Here are just some more photos using top cloud total station, collecting more points. Here we are using the total station to collect more data among the rip on oh, no, is Here we're using the total station and the reflectors to collect more data along the rip wrap, which Dad will explain on in a few. Using a 3DR solo drone equipped with with the GoPro Hero 4 digital camera, we drew out a flight plan, set panels on each control point, and flew the drone autonomously, taking photos as it flew. Here, here are two photos of two of the 42 photos taken by the drone, with an 80% overlap. Dan will now discuss the results. Um, so our results, like a lot of you uh, folks, um, really emphasize that um, me every method is going to have some sort of error uh, likely or associated with it. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, recommendations with that. Our results really uh, are in terms of we have data sets, we created some surfaces from that data, and then we also um, had a point cloud from our uh, drone imagery that um, I'll go into a little bit. The main thing to note is that we're, compare, we're basically comparing the errors. Every method has a little bit of an error and we're kind of comparing the errors between the two. This is uh, really, th this slide emphasizes what we're really doing here, which is uh, Amafka engineers have to keep the waterway within this easement legally. So they have to figure out um, what, what's happening hydraulically uh, to make sure that um, they know uh, what to uh, request for funding, things like that. They also have to know the slope from this side of the site over to this side of the site. This is downhill, this is uphill over here. Um, and so they have to control not only uh, the width of this waterway, but they also have to control the slope along here and provide structures so it slows down before it comes into this uh, the flow slows down before it comes into this hard channel here. Soft channels generally are for um, slowing water flow and uh, creating uh, kind of more natural structures. Um, the uh, engineer that we talked to at Amafka, his name is Nolan Bennett, he uh, basically provided us with a lot of uh, insight into that and talked about how um, his main concern is uh, keeping people safe um, and things like that. Our own safety in that regard, um, we, our main thing was uh, staying aware of the, of the bluffs and stuff like that that we had to work around. We had no traffic, unlike a lot of you, which was nice. Uh, it, was, it was a lot easier for us to just kind of walk around our site. Our biggest thing was probably the road runner that we uh, kept running into. I'm going to start with the uh, GPS uh, 
and uh, total station points. That's what these are here. Uh, we had a practice site, zone B. We'll focus on zone A. Um, and again, we uh, have these points off of our uh, level loop, set the control points in here and in here. And uh, that's really one of the kind of the foundation with only five thousandths um, error, we know that those are, are fairly accurate and then we're gonna compare our accuracy with our GPS and our drone imagery as well. Within our uh, civil 3D points from total station and GPS, we created, um, we created point groups and uh, we were able to segregate those off and create break lines within the software. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but here you can see at the toe of the slope, uh, this map is a little bit, uh, uh, is fairly accurate here, but it wouldn't be that way unless we put a, a break line in there for that. And again, the idea is to create uh, usable um, information for the engineer. This is kind of an, uh, this is after we uh, inserted the break lines into the software. Uh, this data is all digitally made through the civil, it's just civil 3D service auto automated. I controlled a little bit of the, uh, the, triangles, the triangles in there, um, but the brake lines really helped out. But you can see that this is slightly jagged. You can decide whether to hand draw some of those in and smooth them out or fill it them in uh, civil 3D. This is the uh, GPS and total station DEM which uh, was fairly accurate. And here you can see um, that this uh, information is something that the, that the hydrologist or the engineer is gonna look at. And this is that riprap that uh, Ana Issa was talking about here. It forces this flow out over into this corner as opposed to coming out over here into the fence line. Again, they're worried about, uh, about going into that fence line. There. We then uh, did drone imagery, and drone imagery is really interesting if you haven't worked with it. Uh, there's a lot of aspects to it. In terms of the error, there's a lot more places to have error in here um, for vertical precision than uh, the other uh, pieces. One is just the flight path itself and the drone's uh, ability to hold steady in wind and things like that. Here you can see that our flight path basically, basically zigzags back and forth. You can also up your pixel strength in terms of uh, your image by uh, cross going crosswise as well. Here you can also see that um, each one of these pixels, this pixel that I've chosen right here is this green X. And uh, this pixel you can see is in all of these photos with the green rays coming down. This particular pixel is, uh, in this photo, it's orange here, and this orange ray shows that uh, we're looking at this photo right here. Now this, this uh, is in the Pix4D software. It doesn't show um, the actual overlap. We had about 80% overlap of uh, photography. So this is how you set your control points in the software. It allows you to pick this control point. Here you can see our panel, and we're able to enter that pixel with the actual level uh, three-wire level loop information that we have that we know is, is accurate. And so uh, you can actually make this surface that is created in the software uh, pretty accurate, depending on how good the software is at, at processing. And that's kind of the, the, another aspect of the, of the errors. But we are able to uh, fix the uh, software um, surface with our real points by choosing, these are all our control points that we did with our three-wire level loop. We were able to put those into the software, and so now we know that this is fairly accurate. Some other issues, though, that you can see are that there's missing uh, pieces here, and I think that as software gets better, that's one of the things that you'll see improve. Um, and um, I'll show a, a little bit more in, in another slide. This shows uh, what you have to do to process it for an engine, to give it to an engineer. If you're going to, um, to actually give them a surface off out of this information, you have to clean all this up. These are bushes. And here's our control point again. Uh, but these, we have to take these out. This is called extraction. And uh, the software provides you the ability to do that, but it takes uh, some expertise in that. 
couple different uh, pieces of information. This is the point cloud. Okay, so these are all pixels here. And again, there's some missing here. And then there's also what you can do, uh, this is called triangle meshing. And you can also create, this is more of a solid. See, there's no missing uh, points here. And what it's done is filled in uh, the, the missing data by, um, by providing triangles for you here. This is the DEM produced from that same imagery. Um, again, the main thing is overlap and, uh, and removing trees. Here you can see this shed or something like this. You can also see these trees and stuff like that. It, again, it's, it's all uh, fairly accurate or pretty accurate. Here's that same shed here and uh, the trees and things like that. Additionally, you're able to, if you put it into ArcMap, you can um, give an engineer uh, a surface that has uh, uh, these uh, trees taken out. For now, this profile is what would be put into their uh, flow software. Again, the main thing is we're working within an easement. So we're wanting to make sure that uh, we have all this accurate. These are our different, uh, this is the drone imagery DEM, which is this larger kind of purpley one, and our GPS DEM, which is this smaller. And again, that's one of the things that's nice about a drone is that you're able to take a wide swath of points uh, pretty quickly. This is a close-up version of that. Again, with uh, the idea is that we're going to have some sort of vertical error, um, but how do we mitigate that? What do we do with it? Uh, what information do we throw away or can we keep? Down here, you can see that there is going to be some things that you're just like, that's just bogus information. Where did we get that? Um, so you have to decide what to do with that. But the interesting thing that we found here is that our mean error in our GPS points is uh, 0.23 feet. And it's also the same down here in our drone imagery, both of which were, uh, were uh, compared to our three-wire level loop and our control points. And so uh, this is one of those things where you would end up uh, asking yourself, is the control monument that you went off from the city uh, actually the part that's messed up? Since these errors are both the same, we, uh, we would uh, look at that more before we send the information to the engineer and make sure that it's. But this shows also that our data from both our drone and our GPS is matching up rather nicely with our level loop. Additionally, uh, the engineer is worried about the soil type, um, as with uh, the guys who did the dorm um, thing, where we also would look at that. Here, um, it's just something that we might throw in as a surveyor, um, and we would take that into consideration. That's more of an engineering type of thing. Going back to the idea that this is uh, really what the engineers are having to do is do everything legally. And these are the two legal things that they're looking at, the, their easement boundary and the FEMA floodplain boundary. The FEMA floodplain boundary, you can see here, it basically um, shows that this boundary was not updated after they inserted this riprap here. This riprap was inserted and it adjusted the flow so it pops out down here. The FEMA boundary still goes out over this way which kind of lines up with this flow over here. So this riprap was uh, put in but the FEMA floodplain was never updated. They have to worry about that and you um, as a surveyor may, uh, may end up participating in figuring out how to, how to change that, uh, things like that. Uh, that's about it, I think. So, our data results illustrate several important points to consider for monitoring a, scene, uh, a stormwater uh, stream channel. So three water leveling was the most precise, but less efficient due to the fact that it takes a lot of work to run a level from the benchmark and set all these control points. And it would take several days or even weeks to do that. So it was very time consuming to gather the data. Uh, GPS proved to be less precise but more efficient in the usage 
of gathering data because we could just go out there and going off the control points, collect as many data points as we want. Same with the total station, just go out there, set up over our um, bench, uh, control points and collect as much data as we want it. Um, for the drone survey, it proved, it proved to be pretty useful in the amount of time that we had because it, you know, we went out there, flew the drone for about three minutes and captured about 42 images. And so with an 80% overlap, and we were, were able to produce some really good DEMs from that and it definitely showed um, comparison with the points from the GPS and the total station. Um, so um, we feel that uh, based on this, that drone imagery processing is probably the future of uh, monitoring survey once we get some of the errors el eliminated from that. So while each method uh, has its own benefits and drawbacks, um, I guess we concluded that it goes by project by project, depending on what you're going to do and what type of project you're going to, uh, if you have the time to go and do a cross section in Arroyo, you can use the three wire level because you're going to produce the best data from that. And if you want to create a quick DEM of a, a, a stream or Arroyo, you can fly a drone and you'll still get uh, pretty good data. So that's can I throw, can I throw in one last thing? I would like to add, uh, it's important to note that dr drone uh, imagery wouldn't be for some, uh, a project, say, that's 100 or 1,000 or maybe 10,000 acres. Uh, and it, it would just be, you would probably fly that with uh, a regular aircraft. Uh, but our site was so small that the drone proved pretty effective. Yeah, and so, um, you know, we'd like to uh, thank the MAC Engineering uh, Department uh, for their help. And then uh, also Pam uh, Scallon, who is um, from Albuquerque Academy. She allowed us to uh, survey the, the easement there. Uh, John Beltran, who's our lab technician, he helped us with processing the uh, PIX4D images, or the images of PIX4D, and Ron, our instructor. And then Kelsey Chavez, our field assistant. He helped us a lot too with running the loops. Uh, references. This is our team here, and thanks to Ron. Question. Did you uh, run into any rattlesnakes? Uh, no. <laughs> Yeah, it was the winter, so oh, thank God they were hibernating. Was that snow? Yes. Uh, it does snow in New Mexico. <laughs> so for this one day that we were out there, um, we went out to use a total station, and uh, all of a sudden we just got this like flash snowstorm from like eight to nine. It's just like it was like six inches of snow or so, and then we but we still waited because we knew it was gonna melt half hour after that. <laughs> so we were able to go down into the Royal, collect as many points as we can, then all the snow started to melt and it was like, Ron was like, get out of there. And so we, you know, stopped that thing. But it does show what happens, you know, when it does rain or snow and it being melts. And there's a huge amount of uh, runoff that happens really very quickly. So then there, a lot of erosion takes place when that happens. So with the uh, drone technology, if you were a licensed land surveyor, would you feel comfortable uh, stamping a topographic map, uh, specifying accuracy? I also work at an uh, engineering firm called Sauter Miller, and my boss and I have, uh, have talked about that. He just got two different drones, and uh, he's not confident as of yet. He's much more experienced, of course, and so I think it's up in the air, but I really think that it's not about drone technology now. I think right now the drone technology is probably more like a, like a DVD player is to us now. Um, and in 10 years is really where it's going to come into its own and you'll be able to uh, process the uh, surface off of it much more quickly by probably just pressing a button. Because right now you have to do a lot of work to extract the data. Um, so I think it's it's just still on the cusp of growing. So right now, probably not. I wouldn't necessarily just do that. Now. But again, that's the whole idea is you probably want to use a couple different tools. That's a good question, though.
with, with respect to the drone part of your project, can you tell me uh, what you did to ensure safety and re regulatory compliance? So uh, before we flew the drone, um, we had a checklist that we went through, and we also had to call the local the local uh, sheriff's office to let them know that we were going to be flying. And we were right on the edge of the five mile uh, no fly zone because there's a where the uh, police station is, they have a helicopter that they use. But it was we were right on the edge, so we were able to fly the drone because, and then we also were able to call them. And then we did our flights early in the morning around 8:30 temperature had to be above 32 degrees. So we went out uh, around 8.30 and there was hardly anyone there and we had several people placed around just to make sure and we notified any walkers that you know we were going to be flying drone and, and we, you know, since it took three minutes to fly it, um, we made sure that nobody was in the area and we flew. So. And we say we, we actually mean our certified pilot who's uh, okay. Ron, our advisor. He's <laughs> actually the one that had to be the one. Um, he was there with us to make sure. And uh, so he, he's more knowledgeable. If you guys have questions uh, later on um, in regards to that, he has his license for that. So we actually didn't fly it, but we saw how cool it was. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.